Life isn't perfect, and neither are we. Nope. But we know how to face our fears. And have some fun. And talk about all the messiest things of life. Like the messiest things. <laughs> get connected to yourself, get connected to others, and get connected to the life right in front of you. This is The Connected Life with Justin and Abby. That's me. That's you. And you. Hey, friend. Hey, everybody. No, Where no, you? I was saying hey to you. No, I'm, I'm saying hey to the people. I don't need you to say hi to me. <laughs> You're right in front of me. I was just talking to you seconds before this started. <laughs> say hello to people who are listening. <laughs> silliness. Oh, that tickled just me. Just silliness. Guess what we're doing? Having a bed date. We are. We're hanging out on a bed. We should record the podcast like this every time. On a bed? Yeah. I don't necessarily feel like I get the kind of energy that's oh, necessary. That's true. I really like our podcast room yeah, where I'm standing. Yeah, because you like to like... Yeah, I'm <sighs> at the standing table. Mm -hmm. Energy gets me moving. Okay, so we should just expect for you to be bland, boring, like fly on the wall over there? I'm kind of cozy right now. Cozy. Yeah, in my little my little hoodie and my sweatpants. and Yeah. Yeah, I'm just relaxed. We... We had to go to Nevada City. Yeah. For some treatments. We actually worked on another podcast that was, um, we, we, when you listen to it in the future, um, that we recorded, it was in another special place. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're just alluding to it. Uh huh. I'm very We'll cozy just leave that carrot it. dangling. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Dangling that carrot. Yes. So we're in Nevada City getting treatments. Um, we had to, like, we jumped into getting here. Yeah. And took the adventure and we didn't have time to record podcasts before no, we left. But we're doing it here. And it's really fun because everyone's kind of like done and over the whole pandemic COVID thing. And mm -hmm. California is finally officially opening up. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the steel grip of uh, certain politicians is lightning and <laughs> lifting off people's shoulders and their... Um, yeah, they're so naps. what he's saying through all those <laughs> blah, 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 is that there's actually people out there's walking people out around, uh, walking going around. to stores, we had so, I had so many good conversations eating with re at restaurants. Yes, I got to go to a normal restaurant and there wasn't one mask in the entire restaurant that we went in, which was <laughs> hey, great. Hey, we're trying not to make this political. No, it, no. But, but you felt happy that it felt normal. Yeah, it felt normalized. That's my point. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, look, it's back to normal. And there's a sense of relief in my soul. Oh, Absolutely. I took a picture of a bunch of people waiting outside of a restaurant because I was like, it just feels so good to see people waiting outside a restaurant to eat. I know. <laughs> yeah, I was super busy. But I mean, that kind of leads into the point of some of what we're going to talk about today. Yes. Um, because there was a sense of relief to my soul. And I think that, you know, we for months as a collective have not had much relief. As, yeah. a, as a human collective, a world collective. And mm -hmm. um, last week, we, we kind of started dialoguing a little bit about different parts of the um, emotional atmosphere mm -hmm. of the world right now today. Mm -hmm. And we're going to dive in a little bit deeper into that dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so the pandemic started, I mean, in like December, but it really probably hit the U.S. in March. Yeah, it was the end of March or middle end of March. Yeah. Somewhere in, in and, there. and so we've got to look at that. It's been months. And yeah. um, what I'm noticing with my clients is all of my clients are like at the mental breakdown point in life. Right. Like a lot of them are on the edge and I get it. There's like zero judgment. I have had moments where I've been so on the edge oh, myself. I can't take it anymore. Yeah, where you're like, ah! Um, and so I just kind of want to talk through what has been going on to to validate where people are and give people accurate understanding of their capacity in this moment, understanding of what capacity other people are in in this moment, and yeah. then how to get out of trauma. Right, because uh, the key word there is trauma. There's 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 a trauma that's that's been poked on for the yes. entire world and is escalating. And if we aren't deliberate about doing something about it, we're going to keep spiraling as individuals and mm -hmm. as cult a cultural community. Yeah. And so we're hoping to kind of put a spotlight on some of that today and maybe give some tools or at least a, bit, a piece of conversation that'll help relieve a lot of it. And I think, you know, everyone is looking for relief. They're like, how do I get relief? I just know that everything feels horrible because all normalcy. I mean, like we yeah. begin with the idea that 
normalcy was shattered yeah months ago i just keep thinking if we could just have sports again <laughs> right <laughs> like, like little things go to a movie theater yeah people's ways to not, not even medicate but just have you know downtime gra- gradual fun. downtime like oh no i'm gonna put on a sports game we're all gonna cheer for our favorite team uh it's something we do every year we love this or that or we just get away to a movie every once traditions, in a while traditions mm-hmm. things we connect over food mm-hmm. restaurants traditions got shattered in this season as yes. far as uh, hanging out over easter and some of uh some things like that some oh, special holiday absolutely. moments yeah and so people missed a lot of connectivity with family mm-hmm. over the course of this and then on top of that, connectivity with friends. Yeah. And then some people had too much connectivity with family and they're like, yeah, they're get trapped. me out of here. Get me out of here. And then on the real, I mean, like for a second, as we're talking about trauma, there are actually people who got trapped inside of homes where there is abusive experiences. Yeah. So you have an amplification of trauma across the world because yep. of a lot of those homes that didn't have peace at mm-hmm. all in the first place. And then you have homes where there is um, across the world in the US, there are a lot of places where there's poverty, where people yeah. like kids that they got fed when they went to school. And, right. and and then all of a sudden, not only was it not easy to get fed at home, but now what little income parents did have yes. disappeared off the yes. table, which turned into mounting depths of anxiety, stress, fear, fear feeling out hopelessness, of mm-hmm. depression. So there is, I mean, like we don't want to, point out all the horribleness but we have to actually (laughs) dialogue about it because there is an immense weighty depression that's over the globe at some level that's hanging in the atmosphere and at the same time there's been an invitation for hope and some people have been able to dig into hope and we want to maybe even talk a little bit about what it is to dig into hope during this yeah so let's so and we haven't even broached what is going on with race, which we're actually going to talk a little bit about that as well. Right. But just starting this, with, yeah, just starting with the pandemic. But we wanted to start in the beginning. So I want you, if you're listening out there to think through, okay, we just had um, as a whole, like the whole planet basically yeah, humanity went in down general. into so much fear. Like yeah. there has been fear through media because fear, cause it was unknown. What is this? What is it going to do? How does it spread? Like there was so much unknown about it and then fear of doing things. And then there was so much like so many different news sources. So then there was fear because one person is saying you need to take care of it this way. Another person saying you need to take care of it this way. Another person saying this way. So now you're afraid yeah. because people aren't all in agreement there's not unity over what we should actually do so then you're yeah. pissed at the people around you you don't know who to trust what is right you're trying to research there's there's potential propaganda maybe in place in some places where they're deliberately trying to stir fear in certain outlets and different stuff like that potentially so there's even a desire from some people to actually capitalize on trauma in this season so right but that's not we're not going into that i'm just trying to sure my my point is is that there's an excessive amount of that uh escalated fear yeah that's what we're saying there's fear and what happens is People can't process through trauma while they're in it. So when we're in a traumatic moment, like the blood goes to survival in our brain, in our bodies, whatever we actually need. We like immediately compartmentalize things. It's like having your phone. Justin always turns my phone on and shuts off all my apps Uh that are running in the background. But survival mode is actually where like all these apps running in your brain get shut off, whether you want them to or not. So that the energy can be conserved so that you can survive. So we have all this fear and then we have all these unknowns. What is my future going to be like? What is the world going to look like on the yeah. other side of this? What is my family going to look like? Is are, are people I love going to die? Like so many what ifs and future tripping and stress. What am I going to do now that my business is gone? How are we going to make it through this? So you have the collective fear over finances, fear over economy you have all the people who had health issues yeah man this is sounding depressing but i'm trying to paint a picture so that people validate it well we have to look at it honestly we talk about this in the compassion project but in order to get free from trauma you actually have to acknowledge and validate what the trauma is and what happened right 
You have to actually do that. And so I've been thinking this, like, so we have all of this anxiety. I mean, people were freaking out at, over toilet paper. We can't forget because right. so many events Never have happened. Forget. <laughs> Never forget. It's like 9-11. Never forget the toilet paper incident. <laughs> Somebody's going to be so mad that you compared those two. <laughs> but so um, we ended up... We, we just started feeling like, and then you have all the parents who are homeschooling all of their kids and don't know when schools are going to open oh, yeah, back and up. Don't and don't know how to even school their children, which I wouldn't even know. Like, how do I even teach my children right now? How do I handle all this? And like, how do you I, do that when you have full-time jobs? Right. Yeah. Because some of those people, there's, there's a lot of parents that were essential. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're working and their kids are at home and they're trying to figure out like, I have to let go of something to do this. Or they're working at home, the parents. And what do they do with their kids while they're working at home? How do right? you do that? And then you ask the question, what is the right thing to do on a million of these things? And then the, the, the anxiety that goes on yep. with not like, what if I made the wrong decision yeah. for my kids, for my family? I know a lot of people who had so mm -hmm. much um, intensity in their emotions come up in the beginning being like, what, what do I do? Can yeah. I go to this place or can I not go to this place? How close can I get to people? Can I go to work or should I not go to work? Especially people who've had health issues in the past. Yeah. So we have all this fear. We have all this uncertainty, all this insecurity, instability, not knowing. And what that does is it triggers all of our childhood issues. Whenever right. our family felt unstable, insecure, like we weren't going to be okay. So many people I know had things in childhood where the belief was, I'm not going to be okay, or no one's going to take care of me, or my needs aren't going to get met. Those are some really common beliefs. Totally. And all of those, the deepest chord gets struck in COVID when we're out of control, or maybe you grew up with abusive parents. So the government being in control feels like you're right back in your childhood. Right. I'm powerless to some crazy parents or some crazy authority figure that I can't trust that isn't making good decisions for my life. Whether or not at you, that's not about the government, but you're just saying that's the trigger. For yeah, yeah. I, I'm saying that that's, that's definitely an emotion that would come up for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then they like, I'm not going to get my needs met. If you had poverty growing up or you went without food, then all of that trauma comes right back up when you're at the grocery store and you can't get meat. Yeah. Or you don't now you can't afford to get as much food as you need to. But every time you go to the grocery store, they're all sold out because everybody else is buying everything. So all, all we're trying to say is trigger the right. And I, I want to add a couple other things. Mm -hmm. um, there are some people that got isolated in a way where it yes. reminded them of their loneliness. Yes. Of their past. Like, oh, I was so alone as a kid. I felt so neglected. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I was going to get taken care of. I didn't feel seen. And so, again, survival, survival, survival. I and am not okay. I'm not going to be okay. And you're just trying to make it through one more moment. And then what you have is that's what I wanted to, I want to highlight that the social needs, hugging people, you know, what is so interesting. Right. They say that in order for you to process healthily, like mentally healthily, you need 12 mm. meaningful touches, non-sexual touches, <laughs> but like meaningful, not like somebody accidentally brushes you, but like somebody hugs you purposefully or right. someone puts their hand on your shoulder, like a purposeful connection through touch. Yeah. You need 12 touches a day. And all of a sudden now we're not hugging anybody. We're not touching anybody. We have to stay six feet away from everybody at all times. So all of a sudden our brain is at a deficit in how we're processing. Right. You're not even, you're not even getting the fill from brushing up against someone in public. Totally. Like, I just liked being on the, on the bus because I just rubbed shoulders with people. That's gone. Right. Or the, and then the camaraderie, like I'm seeing a lot of people who didn't see very many people like they slowly you can see them their souls start like dying slowly like i can see they get more and more fragile and things get more and more high stakes and yeah. then even the relationships you do have get more high stakes because now they need to meet all of your needs where before you're going to a job right you could get away from your spouse <laughs> right totally that's real and now yeah. all these married people are like well, i don't even like my spouse <laughs> yeah 
So, and I got stuck with them for the last three months. <laughs> yeah, it's like a lot of emotions in every single direction. And then when it started to feel like it was beginning to let up. Right. So we kind of get some semblance of like, oh, we're almost out of the woods. Yeah. It feels like we're starting to come out of the woods. Right. right when that happened, the George Floyd murder happened. Now, I am incredibly glad that there is such an awakening happening. I feel so happy about the, I mean, the conversations that we're having, the conversations that I'm having with other people, that they're having with other people, the videos that I'm watching, the things that are going on through this time feel so important to me. Right, there's some beautiful things happening in the background. However, there was something that was sparked. Yeah, well, so all I was going to say is, we went from thinking we were about out of trauma to diving back into, into it. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a and, whole other part uh, portion of trauma in our nation and in our relationships. Yeah. And so. this ripped open trauma for every minority. I right. mean, I would say most minorities probably. It r- ripped open, especially for the black community, but it, all of the pain from years and from this moment and years and years and years and years and years. So now you have like another wave of trauma coming. And um, I think it's important that people recognize this journey so that we can manage trauma well and not actually have a lot of mental breakdowns. I'm concerned that if society doesn't process this well, we're right. going to go into where like people just start shooting people with guns everywhere right? just because they've lost their mind. Yeah, they've lost their ability to have peace. And you even have... Um, on top of that, then you have um, some of the expressions of how the George Floyd situation, the racism situation is being expressed where there are root- looting and rioting stuff that's happening. So then you have that type of trauma for other people who are just like, I'm scared for my life. Yeah. I don't know if my well-being is going to be or taken business, care of. Or- Something violent or terrible could happen in my community because there's, again, escalating unknowns yes. already after unknowns that were happening. Right. So it just continues to, yeah. There's this compound. story from Victor Frankel who... um who says uh, he was in concentration camps and he was writing about man. It's a book called man's search for meaning. And in the concentration camp, I think that I'm going to probably butcher the story a little bit, but there was this guy. And I think he thought like maybe God told him that they would be liberated by March 31st. And, um, and so he was like, holding on right till then. right surviving like, march yep. 31st comes and goes they don't get liberated right. he dies within a couple days because that's the power of hope and so i'm actually i'm i'm going to talk about the racial stuff um in a second but i'm actually wanting to explain in not a in no way I'm so thankful that it's come up and it needed to. And it was a trauma that sparked it with George Floyd. But I'm just trying to explain to people what went on inside of them was we saw an end to the uncertainty and the trauma. And And we saw like life could get normal, whatever that is again. And then it actually that date of like March 31st got removed. Right. And so now actually now we're on a whole nother, uh, we're on a whole nother trajectory again, which is good, but I'm just trying to let people know that their internal worlds thought they were coming up for air and then needed to dive back in to engage. And so we're wanting to let you know that even part of you. So I think some people are even reacting to the race thing out of tiredness from right. this season an exhaustion an emotional exhaustion mm-hmm. of feeling so much fear anxiety trauma that they don't want to look at it right it's like i can't do one more thing i'm breaking yeah i don't have the capacity and right. i um and so our heart like for me one of my heart goals has been like a commitment to continue to learn and educate and understand and have empathy and be a part of solutions for this beyond this month. Like that's actually my goal. My goal would be that for this whole next year, I mean, we've been processing this for the whole last year. So it's, it's something that I'm not wanting to, 
I'm afraid some people are going to dive in really deep for a minute and then just get burned out and jump ship on the whole conversation. Right. Instead of seeing it as something that is so beautiful and necessary and also recognizing how do we manage our capacity for trauma in this moment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how, and what do we do with it? And so, um, and so one of the things we just want to talk about in trauma, you, you start having adrenaline flow on a much more regular basis yeah. and it can affect, um, you know, I was, we were talking to somebody the other day about how, trauma affects even like your sex life because when people are in trauma they don't have a desire to procreate right and so like i was thinking about because that if, if it doesn't because it because if it doesn't feel at an unconscious uh natural uh design inside of us if it feels like something it's it not going to be safe yeah it's like nope we don't want to bring Lock life that in thing this world down. it's going to be unsafe lock it down mm -hmm. yeah. and so um with trauma, we have to actually be intentional to get out of it or else we're just going to keep where we're then reacting. And I see this a lot on social media and we talked about reacting last time, but I, I want to give the why in our hearts again, like I'm going to have when I'm exhausted, let's say I'm really, really tired and I'm hangry. Yeah. And if you try to elicit a response about a deep, meaningful event Oh yeah. At that point, you have the least amount of time to get something good for me. Oh yeah, you have you have you have very minimal capacity and you may bite my head off even if I have something that's reasonable to talk about. You're like, I don't I, leave me alone. And so this is and I'm not saying anything about the racism, but the wars that people are jumping into um on social media and attacking each other. Those I'm actually saying, I think is a lot because people have so much stress. They're trying to find an outlet right. to release the stress. And so we have to find healthy outlets to release the stress. Right. So that, Instead because, of attacking one another. Yes. Because the more we release it in a healthy way, the more we can have healthy, meaningful conversations around what's going on. Yeah. So let's talk about um, a few ways... I don't know if we want to go into, yeah, let's jump into a few ways to release stress. Sex. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Done. <laughs> <laughs> All the ways have been listed. If you're single, better find someone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I think that um, being able to have lighthearted conversations, just, just as a simple, like, Right at the top. Yes. Just lighthearted conversations about things that don't have to do with mm. all the ongoing craziness in the world around us right now. And being able to do those and laugh about life mm -hmm. and and choose to laugh about life. I had a friend who, when he went through a divorce, it was, it was some of the most painful time of his life. And he was like, there were days that I had to let myself grieve, get angry, have big emotions. And then there are other days I had to give myself permission to act like none of it was happening mm -hmm. and just have fun. Right. Deliberately joke about things and, and watch things that were funny and playful so that I didn't actually get lost in the spiral of depression that came with the heaviness of certain pieces of reality that were going on. Yeah, I found myself like doing that in this journey, like I will dive into like watching a bunch of videos about what's happening and then spend a day where I'm just recentering and connecting a couple days like that and then re diving in because you have to be self-aware for the ebb and the flow of what do you need? Like, I actually feel like I so care. I think like we're a global family, all of the races. Right. And I actually so care that a member of our family, which is the black community, is hurting. That deeply impacts me. But if I drown in trauma, I have nothing to like show up for them. Right. Then if I show up to them, I'm going to be selfish and need something from them instead of have things to to like listen and engage, you know? Yeah. I'll make it about me if I don't I think about it all the time like don't go rescue somebody who's drowning if you can't swim like find yeah. like find a raft <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's that thing of i have to be taking care of my 
heart so that for the long haul, I can walk this journey out well with people. Yeah, absolutely. So another thing that I do for stress relief is read tangible books. And the reason why I say that is there's something that happens. You need like somatic releases of trauma. You need like physical things that you're doing and books. Actually, you're turning pages. You're holding something in your hand. That's not a screen. You're not tempted to scroll in the middle of reading your book because in the sense of like, if you're reading a book on your phone and all kinds of craziness on your phone or whatever. Yeah. So actually like a tangible real book, I think is a, is a good way. Yeah. I think that one thing that was, um, stripped from a lot of people was the ease or the accessibility to working out. Yes. And actually getting their body physical. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially when it started, there were a lot of people that were in states where there was snow still. Right. And all kinds of stuff like that. So they're just trapped inside their house. They couldn't go go to a gym gym. all of a sudden. And I know a lot of people I watched on social media who are like, I've got about 50 pounds I have to lose now from everything that just went on, where they literally f- fed themselves on junk food, which <laughs> crashed out systems, crashed out the brain, made, made them feel more depressed. They couldn't engage. It was really hard. It's hard to try and figure out how to engage uh, trapped inside of a home. Or, oh. And, um, you know, that they were possibly chastised if they went out too much. <laughs> sure. Um, so actually deliberately going hey in this season this isn't just a new year's resolution that i need to like hey lose 10 pounds because it was just christmas but no it's like i have to be deliberate about creating a lifestyle of physical fitness to to shake out like i know that for me stretching and getting a release on my muscles from stretching to running gets out anxiety gets out all the toxins and stuff like that where that is so necessary and it wakes up my brain it wakes up my emotions Mm -hmm. and even in that you connect to yourself yeah in those workout sessions and stuff like that where i'm running or i'm doing something i'm getting away from the screen again getting away Mm -hmm. from the social media garbage and all of that that's got so much toxicity on it and just going i'm going to recenter what do I feel about myself? What do I feel about my life? How do I connect? I Even in those times, I'm connecting with higher truths. Yeah. I'm connecting with a sense of love and a sense of hope and dreaming about what life could be. Yeah. Well, you've got to think about energy. Like trauma is energy. And I really, I'm going to specifically address the race issue as we're, we're coming. It's coming up. I, in this podcast, I'm going to talk about it more. But um but we're just talking about trauma in general right now. And yeah. um, you got to think about it like energy. It is energy stored in your body. It has to get out. We're having this conversation today um, with this guy who's talking about how antelopes, when like, let's say a lion gets them, they will go limp. Yeah. They go into total freeze mode. Mm-hmm. So all of, all of their blood from their appendages starts flooding to their heart yeah it sucks in so that all their appendages just don't bleed out are dangling. And they, go, they go limp yeah and so lions i guess he was saying doesn't they don't like eating dead meat because it yeah, could be bad he convinces them that it's dead so they walk away from it and maybe maybe cut it up a little bit and walk off yeah but so an antelope after the lion is gone all of a has sudden. to shake out all of their limbs to get their adrenaline out, to get their fight or flight responses out. They have to get all the way out of everything that happened or otherwise they'd be traumatized. And I was like, that makes so much sense because they have to go through that all the time living as uh wild animals. And so we have to have ways to release the energy of intensity, of fear, of of trauma out of our body so that yeah. um, so that we can not have the energy stuck. So for me, like I just go on walks and I'm flinging my arms in the air and I'm jumping around and I'm, I'm actually just trying to move my appendages um, and get blood flowing and, and get like move out of the stuck heavy emotions that can come up and I can feel like hopelessness will come up or loneliness or fear about the future. When those things come up, I have to 
tangibly sometimes go do something physical to let it out. Yeah, there is a, there's also a purging, not just of that, but a purging of emotions that I think is Mm -hmm. really key for the trauma deliberately. I've had people talk to me who haven't cried in years. Yes. All of a sudden during this come to me and be like, I don't know what's going on, but I I can feel, I can't stop crying or I feel these tears welling up. And I've had guy, I mean like guys who have been so shut off from themselves be like, I just lost it. Sob crying. Mm -hmm. I was like, why? Like what's different now than before? I just couldn't take it anymore. And he just started to, you know, they've described like uncertainty of jobs, family, stuff like that. And the, it either happens to you or you deliberately give yourself the space for it and be like, right. oh, I'm going to let myself grieve or release. I might need to cry instead of just being angry. So one of the things that I'm observing is that on the internet, there's anger. Yeah. So there's this intense and hatred. anger and, and hatred and rage being deposited on comments. And really for the majority of those, I want to grab each one of those people that are making those comments and say, hey, do you want to get to the real issue of what you're feeling right now? You know, I want to pull them aside and be like, hey, do you want to just cry? I think you're probably pretty sad. Yes. You're probably sad about a lot of stuff, but you're going to this secondary emotion instead of this primary one was the primary one is I have sadness. I have grief about a lot of stuff that I feel really out of control to mm-hmm. and that is affecting my life and, and is leaving me in uncertainty for my future. But again, I'm just going to find something. I'm going to aim my gun and I'm going to rage at it, but that is not going to actually release the trauma. You're going to still have the trauma trapped. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a great place. Like, I need to yell. Okay, I yelled. But what's behind the yelling? Absolutely. Because anger is a part of grief. But if you get stuck in anger, then you don't get to move through the grief. And then you just get re-traumatized. And, and when you make it about other people on the internet, mm-hmm. what it ends up doing is trapping it further. Because you yep. don't give the healthy attention. You're like, no, this is my trauma. Yeah. This isn't about their action or some stupid thing they just said here. It has nothing to do with that. I am in trauma and I need to deliberately release my trauma, my pain about this season. Well, and that actually brings me to uh, one of the keys to get rid of trauma is verbal ventilation. That's the scientific term. Right. Did I say that right? Verbal ventilation. Yeah. And so it's actually scientific. Verbal vomiting. Yeah. It's actually scientific that you need to verbalize the pain that you're in. You need to verbalize what's going on inside of you. Now, most people don't get this. So they just want to complain. They want to be like, did you see what so-and-so posted? Can you believe this person thinks that this person, what they said was okay? Did I send you that video? Can you believe (laughs) this policy that's good? They think (laughs) that's verbal ventilation, but that is actually not. And that's bringing me to what you're talking about. We have to be able until we can articulate and label our emotions accurately, we can't release them from us. So what most people are doing is they want to yell about what's happening externally. And but what we really need is to get to the um, they're the vulnerable emotions. The vulnerable emotions are, I feel sad, I feel hurt, I feel scared, I feel powerless, I feel out of control. Yeah, I feel hopeless. Yeah. I feel uh, defeated. Yeah. I feel disappointed. Yes. So- I feel confused. I just wanted to add a couple Yeah, no, those are good. Do you have more? Um. No, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Only when you were, could interrupt uh, me did you I have I feel them. lost. Yeah. That's a big one. I feel lost. I feel lonely, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So I think going to people, we actually, you need to actually go to people and communicate what you are feeling. I feel powerless because da, 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 da. I feel scared. I feel hurt. I feel alone. I feel like actually being able to say what's going on inside of you and get it outside of you is such an important part of getting free from it. Yeah. Big time. Did you have anything else to add? Nope. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's really important. Like I talked about earlier, comfort is really important to yeah. get people out of trauma. Most people go to food, but that doesn't get you out of trauma. It just no, that's not recycles comfort. you back into it. No, no, because it's not 
It's not human relationship. Comfort is found within the context of human relationship. Mm -hmm. There's things that we have thought that we that are comforting. False comfort. False comforts that we've done. And, you know, part of uh, COVID. Porn, shopping. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a lot of external um, false secondary comforts. Yeah. That got ripped away from us. Yes. Stripped away from us. Yes. Like, oh, I can't go shop anymore. I can't just go eat at the store or at, at the restaurant and check out. I can't just go medicated at a movie theater. Now, some of those are happening inside of homes, mm -hmm. but all the external ways we would run to something else, even the idea that, you know, the sports disappeared off TV. I can't get lost in sports. Right. So again, these false comforts are going away. And now we have to figure out what are these human relational comforts that are necessary and how do we get, get those taken care of? So one thing that I'm just telling my people is I'm like, you need to go like hug people, however, whoever you feel safe to do that with, with your masks on or whatever you need to do. Mm. But you need to go find people and like you need to actually be like, can you just hug me for like three minutes? Because that will change. It actually changes the chemistry in your body when it's like significant or like if you just have your hand on somebody for a few minutes, like on their shoulder or whatever. Yeah, sit next to somebody on a couch and just put your hand on their shoulder or their leg or something. I know that sounds random and weird, but like literally it's. I am connected into another mm -hmm. human being. And it's not just my hands there. It's even the ability to, if I put my hand on Abby's leg mm -hmm. and I actually have an intention internally inside of me that's like, mm -hmm. I love her, I care about her. You can feel that in the relational exchange with friends and you can feel the comfort. There are people that when they touch you go, we all know like, oh, they have good touch. Like it feels safe yes. it's because there's an intention inside of them right. that is I am giving rather than taking. I'm here to just like love you. And when we can offer that up and or ask for it and receive it, that's super powerful. Yeah. I think that um, it's really important. Most people are like, I can't just go ask somebody to hug me. I'm like, you would be surprised. People oh, yeah. love the knowing... guys run around on social media with free hug shirts. Yeah, totally. <laughs> there are people out there like, I'm ready to give a hug away. Well, here's the thing. People love when you give them a map of what you need. Oh, totally. When you just say, I really need a hug because I'm you could say I'm stuck in fight or flight or I'm stuck in trauma and I'm trying to get down. And one or of I'm the just ways overwhelmed inside, I just need a hug. Yeah. But like actually asking people for it and consistently don't be like, well, I got one hug since COVID. So I'm probably good. <laughs> like you need to engage that mm -hmm. so that you can get your needs met because physical touch really does. Now it doesn't help everybody because some people have been really hurt through physical touch. Right. And so they have trauma with it. So if that's you, you can just tell people I don't have the capacity to deal with my trauma with you touching me. Right. But um, but for people who don't have trauma from physical touch, it is a great way to kind of help us get back into our bodies. Because when we go into survival mode, lots of people disassociate, which means they're they get they disconnect from themselves in order to survive. Right. And they just begin focusing on what do I do to survive? That's why some people will get in like modes where they're like zoned out, where they just scrolled for five hours and they didn't mean to, right. but it's because they're not even present enough to say, oh, I think I'm done and I need to get off and go live now. Yeah. One of the things that's really been key for me talking about comfort and even self comfort mm -hmm. is inner dialogue conversations, whether I was speaking to myself out loud or inside my own head. But one of, one of the things that I said, getting out of PTSD trauma that I had to work out of was saying things like, Hey, Justin, you are safe. You are safe. You are going to be taken care of. Um, I'm sorry for what you're feeling. Um, your world matters. You're going to get through this to the other side. Mm -hmm. A lot of inner dialogues like that, especially the, again, the words, you are safe. You are going to be okay. That started giving me uh, that, that affirmation deliberately, not just saying I am, but I was like, I'm talking to myself. You are going to be safe, Justin. Mm -hmm. Something inside of me went, oh. And I and, and I, I began through my even healing through my panic attacks. And in the did past. you believe it when you started? Um, 
not at first, but there was a comforting voice like, okay, I did need to hear that. Mm -hmm. And I would continually uh, on getting out of my panic attacks, kept saying like, you're not alone. The end isn't in front of you. Mm Mm-hmm. You're going to heal from this. You're going to come back from this. Mm -hmm. A lot of like higher truths. Mm -hmm. There was also the element inside of that self-comfort that also came with a a sense of higher comfort Mm -hmm. where I would have dialogues. I remember being um, paralyzed, laying in bed at night when I was in the middle of my panic attack season a couple of years ago. And I was just terrified that I was going to die in the middle of the night Um, wouldn't be able to communicate and I would die. And so I would begin to ask, God, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Do you love me? Mm -hmm. Are you going to take care of me? Am I going to get through the other side? And I would hear these, this internal audible faint voice or unction or sense that would say, yes, I'm here. You're going to get through this. I care about you. I love you. And that was enough to just go, okay, and it would start to relax my body. It would relax the tension in my body. And I would just be, be keep meditating on, on like, I'm loved. I'm cared for. I'm going to get through this. And then I would fall asleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important. And that leads me to the, to the next thing of getting out of trauma that I think is the most important, yeah. which is spirituality. And yeah. so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that. I, I wanted to jump into... Um, gosh, I have so much compassion for any person of color because they just went through the pandemic and then all of the trauma they've had in their life that has never been validated. Right. And all of the trauma done to their ancestors and their history, all of that trauma got opened up when all of us had, had very little capacity. And so for any of you out there that are a person of color, I just have so, I just want you to like, God, would you just come and would you bring comfort and love? Like we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read something I wrote, but I just have so much empathy because I can't imagine having that much pain ripped open when I already being on itch. Right. And so I just have so much, such deep compassion for you and um and so much of this episode like my our heart would be that anybody who's stuck in trauma would have resources to be able to get out and so this is what i wrote so much healing comes when people feel understood acknowledged and validated which this is part of how to get out of trauma I know that I don't know what people of color have experienced. I can empathize, learn, sit in the discomfort and imagine how deep the trauma goes, but I haven't come close to experiencing it. And so there's just so much that I will never know. This is why I've been feeling overwhelming thankfulness for Jesus. I may not understand it, but precious Jesus purposefully chose a life that he could understand it all. He crawled inside the pain so that no one would have to be alone in pain like this. He personally suffered so that he could relate and bring healing and redemption. He chose to be beaten, humiliated, and crucified even though he was innocent so that he could know firsthand what it is like, but also so that he could be fully with us for whatever trauma we would endure. God specifically picked that Jesus would be born in a time and a place where his people were living in oppression. He was born into a people group who had experienced 400 years of slavery in their history and were currently being treated unjustly, crying out desperately for a savior and a Messiah to come liberate them. Mm. I saw a post by Chance the Rapper who talked about how Jesus' death was just like a lynching. Here are a few snippets of what he said. Twice in the book of Acts, the apostolic preachers say that Jesus was hanged on a tree. And Paul takes the old law that says that anyone hanging on a tree is cursed to make the point that Jesus bore the curse for us. Both, this is still from him, both Jesus and blacks were publicly humiliated, subjected to the utmost indignity and cruelty. They were stripped in order to be deprived of dignity, then paraded, mocked, whipped, derided, and spat upon, tortured for hours in the presence of crowds for popular entertainment. 
He also mentioned how both the crucifixion and lynchings were an act of mob violence. As, as I've been just thinking about this, um, this moment where I am, we're going on the journey of learning and yeah. what is healing and reconciliation look and restoration look like for our nation. But I was just, I'm so overwhelmed with gratitude because there are so many things that I don't understand that they've experienced. And it's so kind that God picked a scenario so that in the compassion project, I talk about like one of the revelations that transformed me the most is when God came and he, I saw him come into my childhood and he was like, I saw what happened. And all of a sudden the term faithful witness came into my mind about God, that there's not one moment in our lives that pain happened that he wasn't a witness to so that he he could validate that it happened right. and he could validate why it was painful. And I'm looking at this moment in history and I'm like so glad for Jesus who has seen every moment of racism that we haven't seen every moment that we've invalidated or said didn't exist that people have experienced right. every moment that we didn't get. He's the faithful witness to actually love them and say, I see what happened and I see the pain that it's caused and I see what's gone on. And, and then not only that, we have a God who was literally born into an oppressed people group. Right. Like they were oppressed by the Roman empire so much so that the disciples, the entire time he was here were, were like, let's take over the government. Like they were trying to yeah. get Jesus to do that. And he came into like the lowliest place. He was born in, you know, a manger into a people who were oppressed from a town that they said nothing good came from right. so that there would not be one person in this moment that he couldn't relate to. That there wouldn't be one person that's like, no, but you don't understand my experience. Because not only did he experience so much in his life, yeah. but then he also died so that he could be with us. God with us in the trauma so that there's not one moment of discrimination or pain or hate that they've experienced that goes unacknowledged by him. Yeah, And I've just felt so thankful and this is, to me, this is such a huge key of getting out of trauma yeah. for every person. I, I just wanted to specifically say it because I'm like, gosh, I have so much hope because he provided a way out. He crawled into it. Like when Chance the Rapper described lynchings as crucifixion, to be honest, it actually helped me have more understanding of the crucifixion because I I feel such strong emotions about the lynchings <laughs> like that feels so horrible that it actually gave me emotions like no that's what it was like for Jesus too like both of those were yeah. so horrible and to know like I can never I can never repay the horrible things that have been done in this in this nation yeah. I can go on the journey of, of yeah. walking through healing with people, yeah. which I am happy to be a part of. We get the invitation to be reckoned, like to be a part of the healing. This the is an incredible yeah. moment in history that we get a chance to do something that no one else has gotten to do in America. And I think that's phenomenal. But when I look at it, I'm like, I can't actually repay the debt Yeah, for them. Like, again, I can love them. It's the same as your mom. She's apologized and worked through so much right. with you, but it didn't actually fix yeah. the pain. Yeah. She, she, she couldn't, she, she could not undo the debt that was left there. And so yeah. I just feel this overwhelming gratitude that Jesus came so he could crawl into that pain right. to be with everyone yeah. inside of and that to pain. relieve us of the debt that we've accumulated from one another. Yes. Yeah. And to resolve it. And to, and to be God with us, because like we said, disconnection is a huge part of trauma. Right. So his ability to be with us inside of this moment. A creator that's fully one, that fully chooses relationship. Mm -hmm. 
to be in the middle of the craziness with us and to go, I am one with you. You don't have to work to get to me. I have fought to get to you. I've done everything that I could to get to you because I love you, because I want to meet you in your condition, in in your sufferings, in your trauma. I want to be there present with you, fully Mm -hmm. available to every piece of pain that you need to talk about, share, express, and process through. Yeah, it's felt, it feels very hopeful because when you're looking at this giant wound right. of, of a whole nation, it's right. and not even a whole nation, it's global. There's so yeah. many areas where this pain and wound is coming up, rightfully so. We we need the healing. And yeah, the and you can needing, you can't need healing in this. Yeah. You can't heal until you acknowledge and validate yeah. what is. Yeah. But um the the goodness that that Jesus already planned to give himself to us so that there was hope no matter what has been done to us and no matter what we have done to others. Yeah. It feels incredibly beautiful. Yeah. A gift that's fully available. Yeah. It's really beautiful. But there's there, there, like you said, there is someone that fully identifies with any level of any of our suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've just been thinking about um, just for everybody who's been listening for whatever trauma you've experienced through Corona, through the racism, through just wherever you're at. This is the way for me. This is like the salvation to get out of fight or flight for me to yeah. get out of being stuck. This is I have to grip onto hope that is beyond me for this moment. Yep. That transcends is, my human capacity or anyone else's human capacity because there's mm-hmm. only so much human capacity. It's like when we see how effed up everything is, as the trauma is unleashed everywhere. Yes. There's a place that we have to go in our humanity, God, we cannot solve this. Mm-hmm. We can be partners mm-hmm. in it, but at best we can be partners. We in our own right got ourselves here. Mm-hmm. So if we got ourselves here, we're not going to get ourselves out of here on our own. Mm-hmm. There is something about partnership with heaven and partnership with a good, unconditionally loving creator of going like, yes, we say yes to you invading these places and beginning to bring resolution first and foremost in my heart and then into the heart of the people around me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, for me, it is. I will feel like weighed down by and gripped by fear right. or uncertainty. And so then I have to get to faith. I have to get back to hope and love and peace. And the yeah. way that I do that is that I believe, because the truth is, government is not, it hasn't made me feel safe. Government is not going to fix any of the trauma. Government is not going to fix the problems. Now, the government can try its best to do its part like anyone yeah, else. Some good but legislation is, is valuable. Right. It's valuable, but it's still going to be man's way of controlling things and it's not going to solve heart issues. Well, I was just going to say government doesn't feel like a safe thing to trust because they make all kinds of crazy decisions. Right. And so I need someone bigger than me. Right. I need God. And what it does is it gives me room to be humble. It gives me room to admit the areas that I've failed. It gives me room to admit the areas that I've been wrong. And that's such a huge part of healing the trauma is the humility. Mm -hmm. Here's where I've been wrong. Here's what I can't do in my own right. Here's what Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do. It begins to lift the weight off of us. Uh, to to be alone, abandoned orphans, mm-hmm. figuring out this life on our own. And it actually says, I am opening the door to relationship. I'm prying open the door to relationship inside of me and going, I don't know how to do it. I can't do it all on my own. Mm-hmm. I am available to participate. And then that's where the flood of love and relief can begin to break into our hearts and our minds and begin to resolve things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it breaks down self-sufficiency. Absolutely. Self-sufficiency creates isolation. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that, that... It also keeps pressure on you, performance on you. Yes. Like it keeps so yeah. much and weight on you. And we're drowning in our own hell, in our own suffering. Mm-hmm. Being like, here I am trapped in my own jail cell of I have to figure out how to do this. I have to figure out how to heal. I have to figure out how to help and make the world a better place. And all of this stuff that breaks us because mm-hmm. it's... Uh, we don't have the capacity to be God ourselves. Right. Did so, you have more to well, say? I was just going to say we are, we are an extension 
of heaven's hand here in earth mm -hmm. where we get to be again partnership but to be god ourselves that's not it's too big for any human being and ultimately what we we're saying when we go enter into self-sufficiency and enter into thinking we have to do it all on our own is we are really uh without saying it with words we're saying it through actions it's my job to be god right yes and again that's where we break it's too much pressure it's too much pressure and so we all need comfort we all need love we all need connection and god is where i go to and i don't want this to be an overly preachy thing but i i'm just gonna i gotta be honest and talk about how i've been coping through this right absolutely is i have to worship i have to look at there's someone bigger than me there is someone who's more loving who's more kind who can carry like who can bring comfort who can bring connection and and for me that's been so important praying like i have been i've prayed more in the last few months probably i should have been praying this much the whole time but like even like what's been going on with the the race stuff and corona just and then seeing so many people in trauma it has actually brought me to my knees and it feels so comforting to have a god that you can go to to partner with yep to have a god that you can go to and be like like show up we need you beyond what we can just do i wanted to just read i'm actually going to read this is so i love jesus was born into a very for those of you who don't know he was immaculately concept concepted conceived conceived thank you concepted is not a word <laughs> he's immaculately conceived um which means it wasn't through his parents having sex but he was born to a woman so she was engaged to Joseph. They weren't married when she got pregnant. So it was very scandalous. And back right. in those days, she could have been stoned right. for it. it. I mean, it was like this horror needs to be stoned. Yeah. That that was that was a, it was like a slut shame cu culture. Yeah. Of like, you're going to get it. And it's not just shame. We're going to kill you for this. Yes. And yeah. he could have divorced her for it. So Jesus was born into the scandalous, the most shameful, scandalous situation. Yeah. In a manger where they were. It was a city that they didn't live in. They had traveled 75 miles. Can you imagine being pregnant and traveling 75 miles back then, like yeah. without cars and air conditionings? No, thank you. But um, Mary's a freaking badass. Mm -hmm. So um, super boss. So anyway, this is the night that that he was born. And I'm just going to read because I was so taken with it. And I thought this is so important for right now. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared in radiant splendor before them, lighting up the field with the blazing glory of God. And the shepherds were terrified. But the angel reassured them, saying, don't be afraid, for I have come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard. And it is for everyone everywhere. For today in Bethlehem, a rescuer was born for you. He is the Lord Yahweh, the Messiah. You will recognize him by the miracle, this miracle sign. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloths, lying in a feeding trough. Then all of once a vast number of glorious angels appeared, the very armies of heaven, and they all praised God, singing glory to God in the highest realms of heaven. For there is peace and a good hope given to the sons of men. And I just... I felt overwhelmed by this because he came for everyone, every class, like every social, right. whatever money status you were at, whatever racial status you were at, whatever gender you were. Yeah. He came for every single person to be the rescuer, to bring the good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard, that God would come be human with us, that he would suffer, that he would know what suffering was like mm -hmm. so that he could empathize with us have compassion on us and so that he could go as an innocent man and i think this is why i was so i'm just so thankful for jesus because he was an innocent man put to death by a mob that for no good reason right so he actually understands the pain and the outrage that is happening 
right, right now. And he died so that we would never have to be alone in situations like this, so that we would never have to carry the weight of the world, so that we could have comfort, so that we could have access to supernatural peace, supernatural love, that there would be hope for our souls, yeah. that we wouldn't have to just drown in fear, but there would be actually an answer out. That there would be true abundant life that we could live. And that's one of the greatest keys. Like, why was it good news? It was good news because he came declaring, you are chosen. Mm -hmm. Everything about what I'm doing is because I choose you. Mm -hmm. I love you. You are forgiven. Mm -hmm. You don't have to perform or work to get to me. I have done everything I could do to get to you. I have gone and faced death on your behalf. A radical act of sacrifice and love, declaring and saying, I am with you. I am for you. I will be in you. In, in, in humanity, I will be one with you. You will mm -hmm. be one with me. Full oneness so that you never have to feel or believe that you are alone, that that could be eliminated. And he came to liberate us from the tyranny of, of the the prisons that we've all lived in the prisons of our minds the prisons of our hearts the prisons in this world yeah the oppression we go through the trauma we've been through honestly there's no way i would ever have hoped to get out of the the trauma that we grew up in yeah without a god that is an unconditionally loving source who came fully ready to forgive and to be close and to comfort i can say this that through all of our healing process of all of my trauma, every piece of teaching that I have ever taught was all sourced in that intimate relational connection that I had with God in my most broken moments where I felt the most effed up and I was going, God, I need you right now in the midst of this. Otherwise, I'm going to kill myself or I'm going to fall apart mm -hmm. or I'm, I don't know if I can go on one more day. And then there were keys that were dropped into my heart, into my emotions where I'd hear something that transcended my human wisdom. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I was like, Oh my gosh, I just heard this. I need to do this. This is what needs to happen. And in that intimate relationship came the freedom that um the the liberating keys that freed me from the bondage that I felt in in my mind and in my emotions. And I watched that happen not only in my personal life, but I watched it walk out in our marriage mm -hmm. where when I was at my most oh, broken yeah. moments, we were at our most broken yep. uh, crossroads with each other where I would go out and I'd cry out and I'd say, God, what do I do to solve this? And I would hear something that I'd never heard before and I'd act on it and I'd watch restoration and healing between the two of us and inside of our hearts. Absolutely. Yeah, he's been the answer for us when there was no other answer when we've been at the end of our rope. And I think that's why I felt like it was so important to talk specifically about our faith in this episode, because so many people are at the end of their rope. Yeah. They're at the end of their capacity. They are oh, like, honestly, I think most of us are overly done. We're not even meant to be able to know the horrors of everything happening all around the world. No. Just being able to pay attention to the death tolls in every country on no, the planet. That, that's insanity. We're not supposed to have that level of information going yeah. on consistently hitting us. And then it is a traumatic thing to watch a person be murdered. Yeah. Just that alone. If there was so no traumatic. racism attached to it at all, but you're just watching someone in a posture of authority kill someone right in front of you. Oh, yeah. The human mind and, and, and emotions aren't meant to sit and just sit by idly without being able to do anything about it and watch that happen and injustice of that level. And then the, the trauma of racism being connected to it. Right. Being so much deeper. And so I just know like I have been I've been spending so much time. There's so much hope for me when I read the gospel. When I read what Jesus came, he came to the the people who needed help the most. I feel like I am that person. It, it, yeah. I, there's great hope in my heart. Even as the nation is processing white privilege and what we have actually done to people, it is so much different to process that with a source of forgiveness, mm -hmm. with a source of this I don't have to carry the weight of this. Right. I can take ownership and be a part of the healing process, but I can actually repent and be forgiven and then walk that out. 
And so I just want to challenge you, whatever you're doing to actually be intentional. I know so many people that are just busy and they're just like their lives are driving them. They're not driving it, but you have to consciously choose to get out of trauma and survival mode or you will keep looping. And what happens is when we're in trauma, we keep we keep circling back to trauma again and again yeah. and again and again. And so um, I want to invite you if you're listening and you actually don't know God and you're like, what happened to the connected life? They're going crazy. <laughs> They're talking about religion. Um, if you don't know God, but you, you know, you need comfort. You need a source bigger yeah. than you to come help you get back to a healthy state of being back to sanity um, even if you actually already know God, we just want to remind you now is a time to invite Jesus into your heart and you can just pray something as simple as Jesus. I need you to come be in my heart. I give up my will to, to, to follow you as a good King. You're a good King and I want to know you and I need to know your peace that passes understanding. I need to experience your love that breaks through all of the trauma that I've gone through, all of the pain and the rejection that I felt. I need to experience your supernatural joy right. that doesn't make sense. And I need your wisdom and your strategy for how to love the world around me. There is this verse in the Bible that says, God is the father of all comfort, the God of all compassion. Yeah. And it says that we receive compassion from him so that we can give that compassion away to the people around us. And I've just been aware that if I'm not connected to this source of compassion for me, then I'm not going to have anything to give to the people around us. And so if you just need to, we, you just can ask God, God, I need you to come Help me encounter your compassion so that I can see people that way. If you're reacting to people all around you, you need to get back to, Father, I need you to come show me compassion. Help me experience it with you. That supernatural love, I invite that in so that I have something to give away yeah. to the people around me. That's so good. And, and the last thing I'll say is, because there's so much war on social media and everybody's trying to be like, well, you're the worst because of this and you're the worst because of this. We actually need forgiveness. Yeah. And we need to see humanity back. Like as humans, we talked about this in our last episode, but um, begin praying when you're on social media, pray God help me not to give in to hate yeah. Because we can't fight hate with hate. Yeah. More uh, and violent emotions and violent outbursts verbally doesn't solve violence, doesn't heal anything. Yeah. And people are looking for something to blame for all of the pain that they're in instead of taking their pain that they're in, acknowledging it, venting it, releasing it yeah. and inviting love in. So um, I'm just going to pray one more prayer. Yeah. Do you want to pray? No, go ahead. So God, we ask that you would come into every person who's listening to this right now, who's in pain, that you would come in and that you would come with comfort. You'd come with peace. You'd come with your kindness and your gentleness. God, come liberate hearts that have been trapped in pain, whether recently or for years. Come break hopelessness, despair. Come break hate off of people's lives, rejection off of people's yeah. lives, oppression off of people's lives. God, come liberate your children out of trauma. That peace right now, that people's bodies would begin to experience peace coming and releasing this pressure they've been carrying. Yeah. That safety would be restored. That all of a sudden, all the people's systems that have been out of sorts, that their system, their internal system, would begin to settle and go back to its original intent. That their internal system would all of a sudden be flooded with that peace, that peace that you promise, that you are the king of peace. 
You are the person of peace. The peace would overtake every person listening right now. And they would know all of a sudden, they would know I'm not an orphan. I'm not abandoned. I'm not all alone. There is love available to me. I am going to be taken care of. I'm going to be healed from this season. Restoration is coming. There is hope for a new day. There is hope for a new dawn. There is hope. There is life. There is life beyond this moment. There is life beyond this pandemic. There is life beyond 2020 and all the craziness that is happening. There is an abundant life beyond everything that's happening on social media that you would invade people's homes with your abundant life, that you'd make yourself known in people's dreams, in people's daily lives, where all of a sudden, like the solutions that you would give me when I was in my greatest traumatic moments, not knowing how to move forward, that you would begin to speak, that you would begin to say little things and all of a sudden people go, I don't know what this is. This might, maybe this is God, but I hear and I feel something and it's settling something inside of me and I can see a way out. I can see a way through this to the other side. I can see a way to bring restoration to my family, to heal what's been broken during this time and to, to heal what's been broken in the years that were way before this moment of time that you would begin to enter into people's histories where histories happen and people just said, well, that is what it is. I guess it's just always going to be that way. And all of a sudden you'd bring a new hope and then you begin to show people like, Hey, no, we can go back into this and we can begin to restore, redeem, and we can begin to do the work that needed to be done, that we can revisit all of it. God, that you would begin to revisit all the places that were left in the history and you'd revisit with love and you'd revisit those places with truth that people would come out on the other side of this year, 2020, where all the craziness is breaking loose, that they would come out of it on the other side with more life than they went into it, that they would come out of it going, that year was the springboard for me stepping into the fullness of life that I could have never dreamed of. I got a dream and a vision inside of me for who I could be and what life could be like. And all of the trauma that had been weighing me down somehow got unloaded in the most traumatic year the world had ever experienced in that time dispensation. God, there is something about this generation that we as a worldwide haven't experienced for a very long time in history. And God, that as a world, we begin to get a deliverance from it. Not just what's happening in the world right now, but what's happening in our souls, what's happened in our souls before. So I just welcome love 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 radical love to break in as people are listening radical love to break through places where you are stuck in fight flight or freeze mode mode that love would break in and all of a sudden your body would settle that your mind would settle that all of a sudden trust would break in and you'd feel a sense of trust trusting into to, in tomorrow, knowing that things are going to be okay. A trust that you're going to be taken care of. A trust that you're going to come alive. A trust that you're not just going to survive, but that you're going to thrive. So God, I thank you for every one of your children who's listening right now. Every one of them. I thank you for their lives and I thank you for your intention towards all of the ache inside of them and the messiness of humanity that you're in the process of healing as every one of your child children that opens up their heart and says, yes, I give you permission. I yield my will and I allow you to come in and do a work of love inside of me that you will fully show up in those spaces because you are compassionate, you are caring. You are loving, you are comforting, you are a fully invested, involved friend and in God. And God, we ask that you would heal our nation, that you would heal the divide, that you would bring things to light, but there would be a supernatural love and healing that would begin to break down the walls that have been built between the races for years, that there would begin to be supernatural strategy of, of how to bring reconciliation and how to bring the, the, 
the people together, God, that this would be a season of acknowledgement and validation, but a season of transformation where it doesn't just get stirred up, but there's actually um, beautiful covenant relationships made where there's actually beautiful restoration, where trauma gets released, where injustices get righted. We ask that you would come and that you would do a supernatural move in, in America and in England and the world where there's been so much pain over the, the issue of race, that you would raise up leaders who are humble, who, who could lead in repentance, who could lead in in reconciliation. You are the God who reconciles. You came to bring equality. You came to bring healing and you came to liberate those who are oppressed. And so we ask that your very goodness, your very nature would show up on this planet and that you would help every person listening agree with the love that is bigger than us in yeah. this moment. Yeah. God, we ask that you would move in a mighty way, that revival would start through the races coming together. Yeah. Through the, the God in the midst of this trauma that people would cry out to you and that you would actually encounter them in profound ways as comfort and the God who is with us in the pain. Yeah. Well, for those of you who are lis listening still, thank you so much for joining us. And if you know someone who needs hope in this season and needs to find a way out of the trauma that they're feeling and find solutions for it, we just ask you to share this with them. Let them know, hey, there's a message of hope and love out there and acknowledgement. And so we just thank you for listening and, get, and uh, spending time with us in our little bed date. In our date. bed date? <laughs> yeah. This is what we do in our own time. We pray like this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Also, last thought, but be aware that your capacity might be smaller because trauma takes up a lot of our capacity. So be extra kind and gentle and generous to yourself. Yeah. Peace out. <laughs>